Hello, everybody. Jason Cormier here from Room 214. I'm one of the co-founders here, and I'm super excited uh, to have you all join me today. I'm going to go ahead. It's funny. I've got a huge uh, sticky note here that says, don't forget to hit the record button. Um, so bear with me here as I do that. Let's see. Oh, hey, looks like we're already recording. All good. So anyway, I uh, just want to welcome you again. Um, thanks so much for joining. Really quickly, uh, just some quick uh, tips to get us started. Uh, you will see the ability for, uh, there's like a Q&A section um, on the bottom of your screen. You'll also see the ability to chat and then raise your hand. Um, definitely throughout this presentation, please ask questions. Um, I will be waiting to answer those to the best of my ability um, at the end. So hopefully uh, we'll get through this in 40, 45 minutes and have plenty of time for questions. So please enter those in the Q&A. Uh, if you chat, I will look at that chat too. And if I have an opportunity um, to answer uh, during this time, I will. And if not, uh, I will follow up with you. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, you're welcome to do that because that is the functionality. But I'll warn you right now, I'm, I'm not going to respond to any hand raisers. Uh, so hopefully that's helpful. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen here. Uh, and we'll get rolling. All right, here we are, how to become a category leader. Uh, so real quickly, I'm just going to start with one really super important question. And this is a question that uh, a lot of businesses are asking, of course, and it is, how can our business be better? This is a great question to ask. Uh, and uh, we ask that question here too, but I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the problems that arise uh, that are associated with this question. One is this idea of uh, big data and the promise of big data and how in so many ways big data is supposed to make our lives easier. Uh, but if you really think about it uh, in terms of where big data is being used these days, uh, where it's being used mostly is big ad platforms. Uh, and so what that means is that a lot of us essentially have access to the same data. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not often that a that a company, at least the kinds of companies that we're used to working with, uh, is really great uh, at using data. In fact, um, I didn't just make this up, uh, what I'm sharing with you now is uh, this comes from the annual CMO spend survey uh, that Gartner puts out, actually just came out this month. And what you can see is a lot of companies um, are spending a lot of money uh, on marketing analytics uh, and really trying to understand the data. You can see from the red quote here, expensive and talented data scientist resource, uh, resources are often mired in basic operational work. Um, and so that is just a little bit of the byproduct of people trying to say, yes, we should be data driven. Um, the problem is they're having to invest quite a bit in that data um, and oftentimes they're not getting the return. So ironically, big data, a little bit of a problem. Um, software. Uh, software, uh, how the heck is software a problem? Well, I'll just go to the next slide here and I'm sure all of you have seen your share of things like this in various presentations. The problem is there's just so much to freaking choose from, right? Uh, it's funny, this particular infographic is four years old. Uh, the newer ones contain so much more, right? So this is the, the marketing technology landscape and all kinds of software out there. And how do you even pick and choose, right? And so this is uh, a bit overwhelming at times. And then of course, uh, there's experts. And so guys like me walking around telling you, you know, what you could and should do, right? And so when you think about uh, this big picture between big data, software, all the expert resources out there, right? What podcast do you listen to? What conference do you go to? All of this was supposed to have made growth easier for us. Uh, but the reality is with everyone accessing the same, believing the same, uh, they all eventually do the same. Uh, so that's an interesting reality. Um, and so the common result is what? Uh, companies will tend to do what's safe. Uh, they'll go where others go. They see how others have succeeded and they say, hey, we could copy that. Maybe we could do it better. Let's go do that. Uh, and then they also apply quote unquote best practices. And the reason we have those in quote is because, you know, we see, <laughs> we see a lot of best practices. And the reality is when everybody's doing the same best practices, they actually are really more like basic practices uh, and a herd mentality is kind of what's, what's happening out there. So the outcome is a lot, of, a lot of us are targeting the same demographics. We have very similar messages. We're in similar channels uh, doing all this marketing. 
Uh, we have algorithm and media fatigue. What the heck does that mean? Uh, we'll think of Google. Uh, whenever Google updates its algorithm, uh, now all of a sudden it's up to us to respond accordingly, right? We have to keep up with these updates. Uh, media fatigue, well, you know, think about if a new competitor comes on the market and starts buying ads. Well, all of a sudden uh, that ups the ad spend and, and maybe you've got to invest more in advertising. Um, holidays up the ad spend, uh, election years up the ad spend, uh, and, and really all of this equates into uh, levels of inefficiency, uh, incoherence, uh, and really it's, it's quite exhausting. Uh, and what happens is you've got a bunch of companies uh, that are, get caught up in this race to being better, um, and, uh, and it's a brutal race. So what I propose to you today is there is a more important question. Uh, then how can our business be better? And it's how can our business be different? Uh, and why do I think this is an important question? Well, this really gets to uh, our entire topic today, and that's on becoming a category leader. And this is core to category leadership. And so let's just uh, take a little pause around that concept of category leader. Why do we even need this? What does it mean? Uh, you know, our brain organizes things in containers or buckets. It categorizes things uh, so that we have shortcuts by which to make decisions. Uh, and so really that is the whole uh, concept of how we categorize things. Uh, being a category in leader in your industry means one super important thing, and that's market dominance. Uh, and if you look at, there's plenty of studies across uh, category leaders, uh, across various industries as well. What you find that on, is on average, 76% of the market is what the category leader owns. Uh, and so the pursuit of category leadership is, is certainly worth it. There are several flywheel effects, pardon that buzzword, um, that category leaders uh, get to know and experience. Um, category leaders, they just dominate the market, right? There's, there's another thing, uh, getting a little bit into the cognitive science, a little bit of neuroscience for you. There's a bias known as the anchoring effect. Uh, and that is when the, the first time you ever hear a certain uh, piece of information or you see a certain product, uh, you tend to anchor thought leadership on that source uh, that brought that to you. And so category leaders enjoy that, certainly. Uh, and then oftentimes there's really huge gaps between the category leader uh, and would-be competitors, which means that the audience, the buyers, you and I, will typically gravitate towards a category leader. And, and oftentimes the only reason we won't choose the category leader is because we're just looking for a, a lower price. Um, and oftentimes the alternatives to the category leader, well, they can look dated, uh, they can even look unintelligent. Um, so no shortage of reasons why to pursue category le leadership, uh, but market dominance is really the, the uh, essential goal. Um, also the creation of your own category. Um, being a category leader by definition requires you creating your own category. And some of you might listen to that and go, what? Oh my gosh, creating a category, like what, what do I need to invent a new industry? And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides uh, because there's quite a range of, of creating categories. Uh, and then ultimately this, I cannot emphasize enough, this idea of being different, not just better. And this is really what category leadership is all about. It's emphasizing that different um, understanding that different sticks, uh, and, that's, and that's really a huge part of the power um, of being a leader in your industry. So uh, in terms of creating a category, there's kind of two ways to look at this uh, in terms of the category creation spectrum. One is think in terms of uh, a category and then basically creating a subcategory, uh, something that's simple. Maybe it's one product. It's very niche, uh, but it's a minimal approach. So for example, uh, think of the bedding category. Um, or even bed sheets. Uh, and then you can look at a company like uh, Sheets and Giggles. And this is a company that creates uh, eucalyptus sheets, right? Who, who would have thunk uh, sheets would be made out of eucalyptus and why? You know, what's, what's so special about this? Well, we get into, into a discussion about hypoallergenic and, and uh, you know, the durability of cotton, the comfort, uh, how much you sweat in your bed. There's all kinds of problems that this company is solving and now they are leading the way in this emerging category. Um, now on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, you know, we're talking about something that's more complex, still very niche, uh, but integrated. And so what do I mean by that? Uh, let's look at a B2B company, a company called Exactly. Uh, and so uh, just to quickly give you the lowdown on Exactly, imagine that uh, you are in charge of a sales force. Uh, and more specifically, you're in charge of 
commissions that have to be paid to that sales force and you're in charge of dividing up the territory by which all the salespeople work. Could be nationwide, could, could be global even. Uh, so this is a huge responsibility, right? Well, exactly got into an area known as um, uh, incentive compensation. And so essentially, uh, this is the idea that they're producing software that actually automates the process of paying salespeople. Um, and that might sound like, well, geez, that's a no-brainer. What's so brilliant about that? And why is that category so special? Well, the reality is um, that category is quite old and there's plenty of people competing in it. Um, but people, believe it or not, use spreadsheets to track sales commissions. They do it all the time. Uh, and there are huge mistakes that can happen as a result of that. Well, exactly. It's been doing this for years. And as a result of that, they've been collecting a tremendous amount of data, data that they know how to use. And now, exactly is an emerging category leader in something called sales performance management. And one of the reasons is they do something completely different than no one else does. For example, um, imagine if your top salesperson, you had the ability to be able to tell that they were getting ready to find a new job simply based on how they were performing in the field. And so that is a reality with good accuracy, exactly has the software and the capabilities to get into that area to, to determine things like that. Uh, determine what makes the most sense uh, as far as separating into uh, different territories. And it's all very automated. It's very data-driven, super unique. And again, SPM is now their emerging category. This integrates eight different products. Uh, we can have an entire separate discussion about this, but I think you get the picture. Bed sheets to B2B software, it's quite the spectrum. So where do we get, where do we even begin with all this? Because there's so much uh, to cover and I know we've got a pretty limited amount of time. So what I wanted to do uh, to get started is just share with you a category design framework. Um, there are other frameworks out there. Um, certainly some are more detailed. Uh, I've seen a couple others. Uh, this one is more abbreviated uh, for the purpose of today. And what I want to just say about this is please don't get the impression that I'm suggesting you can become a category leader uh, by month five. Uh, in fact, more typically, it's a six to eight year endeavor. Uh, and there's a lot of research to support that. But what I will say is here are four stages. Um, and the areas that are bolded are the ones that I'm going to walk through today, three specific ones. Uh, and these are the ones in, in our experience we have found to be extremely important, right? And so um, let's get started. We'll go ahead and uh, focus on the discover area and the interviews. So I'm going to make some quick assumptions here. I'm going to assume that you know what the world is missing, right? You're operating a business. Maybe you've been selling a, well, clearly you've been selling a product or a service. And in your experience, you keep bumping up against something and you're thinking, okay, we need to create something new. We need to modify because the world is missing, you know, fill in the blank. Um, I'm going to assume you've gone down the path of collecting facts and opinions uh, from internal leadership. Uh, you've actually done interviews with maybe board members or trusted advisors. And this is all, uh, this is all part of the practice of category design as a discipline. You, you conduct these interviews with leadership and advisors. And I'm going to assume that you actually have an insight about how you can uniquely solve a problem. Um, and so real quick, if these three things to you seem like they're, you've got a long ways to go or you, you know, just need to get started, um, great. And, and this is where you would get started. Uh, but something I want to get into next and talk a little bit more about is the interview process. Because traditionally, category design um, as a discipline looks more at the concept of interviews in and amongst uh, an internal team and in and amongst uh, the advisors uh, in, in that ecosystem within that team. What it doesn't typically do is look at interviews that are related to customers. And this is where we're going to take really a bit of a deep dive. So um, what are we talking about, interviews of customers here? And this is where it gets really interesting. So um, these are jobs to be done interviews. And for those of you not familiar with jobs to be done, I'll just give you the very, very brief overview of it. Uh, this guy, why do I have this guy on the screen? This is uh, Professor Clay Christensen. He's out of Harvard University. And for about the last 20 years, he has been leading the charge uh, on this uh, theory called jobs theory. So what's the theory? The theory is that you and I don't just buy a product uh, or a service. The idea is we actually hire a product to help us make progress in our lives based on the specific and unique circumstances that we have. Okay, we don't just buy a product, we hire a product 
to help us make progress based on the circumstances that we're, we're dealing with day in and day out. Okay, so cool, cool theory, brah. Why do we need this? We need this because, as Clay Christensen would tell you, um, this world is really focused on data right now. Uh, and data is awesome. As marketers, we love data. It's predictable. Um, it provides awesome upside. Uh, but he also talks about the fact that it is limited to providing correlation, right? And so correlation, an example of correlation is um, I, I sell to an audience on Facebook that has certain uh, demographics, certain features and attributes. I can spin up a lookalike audience and sell to another audience that looks just like them. And with some statistical accuracy, I can predict what my sales will be, right? There's correlation happening there. Now, what's missing is that correlation does not equal causation, right? And causation is the reason why people buy. Uh, and so even with all this wonderful data that we have out there, um, no set of quantitative data, analytics, uh, et cetera, are really going to tell you why people buy. And so we use jobs to be done interviews to really get at the heart of that, the core of of, of what people are doing to make progress in their lives based on their circumstances. And so I'm gonna walk you through this process. Um, it's always recommended to use a third party for this kind of stuff, but the reality is I'm gonna share with you what we do. And this is something you can do yourself. You can adapt this as part of your culture and you can do it internally. So I'm gonna walk you through our process. And what I'll offer um, just before jumping into this is that these kinds of interviews um, are so powerful, they really provide so much more than any survey would. Uh, or any focus group for that matter. And, and those, those instruments have their place, uh, but this can inform, this just goes way beyond. And certainly from a category leadership perspective, it will inform you unlike, um, unlike anything else. So getting to it, where do we start? Um, what we do is we do interviews with customers. Typically we target a 45 to 60 minute interview. We record the interview. Um, and ideally we're talking to customers that have purchased within the last 90 days which gives us some real cultural relevance. It allows us to evolve over time. But the way that we start our interview is we talk about the point of purchase, like the moment that they made the decision um, and, and oftentimes that, that's at a point of purchase. Um, and so we'll start with, uh, we'll basically start with jogging the memory. And what I mean by this, these questions might sound kind of silly at first, but it's like, okay, were you in front of your computer that day when you purchased? Were you standing in line? What was the weather like? Who were you with? And this is a really interesting thing because the mind will actually unlock memories uh, that they didn't even know they had. And so that is all we're doing. Um, from there, we'll go into, you know, what was the initial thought when you, when you made this purchase? So for example, most, uh, pretty recently, uh, I bought a bed. Um, my initial thought, you might think, was, um, well, you know, I figured out I just needed a new bed, and so I started to do a search online. Well, actually, my initial thought came years before that when I was having back pain, um, and so there's a whole discussion about back pain, right, um, and not just, yeah, I was shopping for a bed. Uh, what was the first action? So oftentimes, is, for, for a lot of us, that is, you know, going to the internet, uh, jumping on Amazon, whatever. Um, what's the second action that you took? Uh, and then ultimately what happened since then, since you purchased the product? And I'll just say, this is super interesting, right? Um, jobs theory is been used traditionally for product innovation. We have found a way to use it for marketing uh, and, and for category leadership and for informing content. But when you get into since then, you know, oftentimes what you're talking about is since you bought the product, how did it help you achieve progress or how did it fall short? Did you in some way have to hack the product? In other words, did you have to buy something else and pair it with a product? Or did you have to modify the product? Uh, and I can tell you some work we did um, with a shoe company. Uh, we found out that people were hacking the product uh, by actually spraying the shoes with uh, a waterproof solution. They wanted the shoes to be waterproof. And this was something that was actually common. Um, and so lo and behold, what happened? The company took that insight. Uh, they fired up a Kickstarter program asking for $30,000 so that they could invest in this waterproof boot. And lo and behold, um, you know, the market spoke and they ended up raising something ridiculous like $290,000. So anyway, love that story. Um, now, beyond creating this timeline, there's also things that we're very carefully listening for. Um, and when we're listening to, these com uh, to the people in these interviews, we're wanting to take their insights and put them basically into four different buckets. And I'm gonna go through those four 
with you right now. So other than creating the timeline, this is what we're doing. This idea of push, right? Internal forces driving the need to get the job done. Other options are not good enough. The emotional and practical reasons why it's time to act. You know, um, if my wife were pregnant, for example, she would be pushed into conversations she hasn't had in a long time. Uh, that's not going to happen, by the way, but uh, just using that as an example. Um, pull, what are the external influences enlightening a new way to get the job done? Uh, so, you know, think of an ad, think of an influencer or an early adopter, a cool factor, a vision of what could life be like. So again, we're listening to people very closely in these interviews and we're trying to determine, okay, what they just said, does that go into a push bucket or is this, is this how they're influenced? We're going to put that in a pull bucket. Um, here's another one, habit the everyday routines performed in lieu of the change that we want them to make. It's business as usual, comfortable patterns, right? So with exactly uh, example, people that are managing sales commissions, you know, my comfortable pattern is that I open up this spreadsheet. That's how I've always done it. Um, so we're really trying to figure out what needs to be left behind to achieve progress. Uh, and then finally, anxiety. And I can't emphasize the importance of this one enough. The hangups, the fears, the skepticism, what's holding us back from making a change. Um, and hurdles that may seem too much to overcome. And so if you think about anxiety at a very practical level, uh, this is what keeps us from acting, right? So, so back to my example of buying a bed. Um, I went through a push-pull conversation or reality myself. I decided, okay, I think I know what I want. I get on Amazon, I start looking for a bed, Next thing I know, I'm seeing, oh, well, somebody who bought this product's interested in this product, and what about this? And this price is cheaper, and these reviews are better. An hour and a half goes by, I'm anxious as hell, and I haven't bought a bed. Uh, and so whether that's B2B software or that's bed sheets uh, across the aisle, across the range, let's just say, um, anxiety uh, definitely is, is a huge factor to overcome. And so all we're trying to do, by the way, is collect uh, this information so that we have knowledge on how to proceed uh, and that we gain wisdom, which is actually applying that knowledge that allows us to learn how we can do it better next time. Uh, and this plays um, not in, just in terms of helping us define uh, category leadership, but actually it plays across our brand marketing and sales efforts, right? So we have this area of push, pull, habit, and anxiety that we've collected. Um, now, this other thing I've already talked about, this, the timeline that we've built. Uh, this is interesting to consider because you can get very specific. Uh, you know, you might determine from these interviews that, wow, it's, it's pretty interesting that there's only two weeks between the first action and the second action somebody takes. Uh, or, wow, once they, make the, they take the second action, the decision comes almost, you know, four months later. So it's like, what does that mean in terms of your communication cadence with somebody who's, you know, a prospect or interested in buying uh, from you? How might you develop a drip campaign based on some of these insights? Um, and oftentimes, you know, you can, you can uh, rely on marketing operation systems, but this is a whole different way to, to validate and, and check those kinds of activities. And then finally, I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but it's definitely worth mentioning. The other thing that we pull out of these interviews is uh, insights on rivals and substitutes. So you might think you're going to launch a new category or you know, you're already pursuing category leadership and you know who your competitors are. Well, in these interviews, we'll oftentimes find that there are names that come up that maybe aren't necessarily your competitors, but they still keep coming up. And so it's like, hmm, what does that mean? How might we have to make a change as a result of people's perception that these are my competitors, right? Substitutes is a brilliant thing, and I could go off on this. Substitutes allow us, allows us to look at, well, geez, we can uncover new audiences uh, that we didn't even know exist, existed, right? It's like, um, what happens when somebody says, uh, yeah, I use this and this instead of prior to buying your product? And it's like, huh, what, what does that mean from a new audience perspective? So there's a ton of opportunity here, right? Jobs to be done, interviews. So really quickly, this is a little bit of geekery. A lot of people ask us, you know, how many interviews should we conduct? And this practice falls into what's known as usability. Uh, and so this equation here just demonstrates that 15 is, is somewhat of a sweet spot. Now, obviously, you can have different customer segments. But I will tell you from our experience, um, this does fly in the face of trying to uh, very, you know, systematically divide interviews by a persona. What we have found is that regardless of region, regardless of persona, um, oftentimes people are trying to make the same progress. Um, even when their circumstances are different, oftentimes they're still trying to 
uh, you know, purchase a product or make a decision based on, on a progress uh, that has a lot of commonality. So even when we're interviewing seven, eight people, we'll start to notice certain overlaps uh, that are significant. Um, and that's just uh, one of those good things to know. So we've talked about the interviews, taking a little bit of a deep dive there. Uh, next, I want to talk about, uh, I wanna, I'm just going to touch on the problem uh, a little bit here. And this is probably the most key insight um, that we've discovered in, in uh, going down this path of, of uh, category leadership as a focus for our company. And so I'm just going to give you the, the quick one on this. Here's the objective. You really want to condition the market by marketing the problem. I love this. I'm sitting in a conference room uh, at room 214 here. And, and usually when I'm about to say something super important, the train comes by. So it, it could get loud. Anyway, <laughs> condition the market by marketing the problem. Why is this such a, uh, you know, wow, cool. Sounds really neat. What's so big about this? Here's the big deal about this. You and I as business leaders, as marketers, we're passionate about what we provide. We want to talk about the features. We want to talk about the benefits. It's all about our solution, right? Um, but category leaders don't do that. They focus far more on marketing the problem. They have to define the problem, and then they market it. How do they define the problem? Well, they know it from their own experience, right? But then they've done interviews. They've done jobs to be done interviews. Um, now they've totally validated it, right? So how do we go about marketing the problem? What's the big deal with that? Well, there's the obvious problem. Right? So this is the problem that um, everybody knows. Yeah, of course we have that problem, but didn't think there was a solution for it. Um, and maybe that solution is, is something you have. Uh, and then there's the revealed problem. And this is the kind of problem that uh, you speak about and people are like, what? Oh my gosh, I didn't even know I had that problem. And then they're like, oh man, yeah, I totally have that problem. And then guess who looks like the expert? Guess who looks like the thought leader? It's you right? Because you're the one who's revealed that. And so conditioning the market by marketing the problem is really uh, an awesome objective to, to go after. And so covered that, like I said, that was really quickly. The remainder of our time, I'm going to focus on uh, the POV. Um, and I'm going to give you just a very specific set of actions so that you've got a takeaway from this webinar. You can actually go and start creating your POV today if you don't have one. Um, and so real quickly, let's just talk about what do I mean by POV? So when you think about, um, you know, we're all familiar with things like vision, mission, uh, maybe your com company has a mantra, uh, maybe it has a brand narrative. Well, your POV is actually all of those things. Uh, and your point of view is really what distinguishes you, what truly makes you different, not just better, uh, what outlines um, the, the POV not only um, outlines almost exhaustively the problem, uh, that's out there, but it also offers a vision for the future uh, to, to solve that problem um, and a way for you to go about uh, essentially uh, bringing your strategy to life. And so the POV is super important because, and I'll just say really quickly, you know, we think of a POV in terms of one or two pages, uh, or you could assume 25 to 30 slides, each with one sentence. That's just to give you a point of reference on, on a POV um, that is uh, digestible and understandable. And the power of a POV isn't just that it's a well-written document. The power of it is that it must absolutely be shared with those in your organization so that they can take that point of view and adopt it as their own. Um, and, and I can't even emphasize how, how important that is, uh, especially uh, in this area of category leadership. And so let's just talk really quickly. How do you go about creating your POV? So what we'd like to do is uh, recommend that you document your rant. And what do I mean by this? It's like, think about the problems, um, how you know they can be solved, how people are still contributing to them, and it almost pisses you off. And now for 20 minutes straight, just free flow, write about what are the problems. Uh, what's the problem in this world that you can solve? Uh, we, we have here a hot pen technique. Um, that's actually a, a method by which if you find that you're writing and then all of a sudden, you know, you're like, oh man, you're starting to pay attention to grammar or, or you're thinking, oh no, I've got writer's block all of a sudden. Well, the hot pen technique says, just keep going. And if you have to insert a cuss word every once in a while, that for some reason will help the flow again. It's a weird thing, but it works. Okay. You can also think in terms of uh, a persona or a particular use case uh, by which your solution solves for that problem. Uh, and then finally, 
uh, you can think in terms of how this problem looks like from a story or even a movie trailer perspective. So, you know, in a world where sales leaders are using spreadsheets to track commissions, you, you know, you can just go down your own path with that, but be thinking in terms of a story. So you get all of this out uh, in a really loose form. Second thing you want to do is get in and tighten the language. And so this is huge. Make sure that your document is easily read by a sixth grader. Um, it's so easy to put all the jargon in the world into this thing. Please try not to do that. Um, have it tell a story. Uh, beginning, middle, um, and end, with end being your solution, your vision for the future. Um, and then the, again, this is really super important. Actually make your POV really heavy on the problem side. Even up to 80%, you're talking about the problem uh, and the particular ramifications of that problem. And then the 20% uh, is really your vision for the future and how your solution satisfies uh, that problem and for who. Uh, what you don't want to do is get into features and benefits, uh, especially in your, in your POV uh, document. And my friend Eric Whedon would always say, um, uh-oh, you've pulled out the feature spray and now you're spraying me with it. And, and stop spraying me with the feature spray. Uh, so the other very important thing, once you've got your document dialed in, and I'll just say, um, you know, this could be something that might take you a few days. I can tell you for us, it took us months to get this POV down that, that we have. Um, and I will also say, um, if you reach out to me and I perceive you are not straight up competing with me, <laughs> I, will, I will share my uh, document with you and, um, and the way in which we shared it. And actually that's, that's what I'm talking about here. So uh, when you share this document with, uh, your, with people um, inside of your organization, uh, what we recommend is that you document the purpose first. So why are you sharing it with them? Um, the, what we actually did is we put questions um, in front of the POV that allowed all of our people to answer, what do we do? How is it different and who's it for, right? And so um, if you just hand over a POV to somebody, uh, hey, it, it might be compelling and maybe even self-explanatory, but giving context is going to be super helpful. Uh, and then the other thing you can do is uh, incentivize, incentivize others to make it their own. So whether that looks like several coffee cards, whether it looks like a cash, Donation, you know, I, I don't know. You can figure that out. We have some ideas for you. But the idea here um, is that this could be an exercise in people standing up, they've memorized it, and they're delivering it uh, to others in your organization. And please don't get me wrong. The idea is not to create a bunch of robots that are like, this is the POV. It's, it's more about how do you enable or facilitate a process by which they can truly make it their own. Uh, and be an internal spokesperson within your organization. Because when you think about what's going on across your brand, your marketing, your sales, there can be a lot of incoherence there. If people are dialed in on what that POV is, um, that incoherence goes away and, and then you begin building coherence. Uh, and this is not something that a marketing team does. This is something that should be done absolutely starting from the very top, CEO level and on down. So I've, I've talked about this, uh, gone through these uh, three um, stages uh, covering the POV, and you can see this gets into now activating um, what happens across your brand, your marketing, and your sales campaigns. And because we don't have that much time today, I do just want to touch on um, Sheets and Giggles once more uh, and, and just show you, uh, this is a screenshot taken uh, from their website, but this, this is an example of how the insights and everything that they did pulled through across their brand, their marketing, and their sales. If, if you go to uh, buy sheets, <laughs> a lot of times what you'll see, um, and if you just look at advertising for sheets, it's very foo-foo. It's very, uh, you know, everything's white. Uh, there's a middle-aged couple sitting on a bed with wine and cheese, um, and, and sheets and giggles, they've just gone in and they've totally disrupted. Uh, you know, and, I mean, look at these clowns here, right? Uh, and, and just the way that they use, you know, order some sheet, learn some sheet. Uh, when I ordered the sheets, I got the box, and sure enough, the note on the front is like, sheet, yeah, thanks for ordering these sheets. Uh, it's interesting, you can see, um, you can see actually how they're marketing the problem uh, a little bit here too, right next to the solution, of course, uh, but, you know, they're talking about friction, they're talking about sweating at night, um, you know, and, and there's other things too that aren't even on here in terms of how uh, sustainably favorable uh, eucalyptus sheets are instead of cotton sheets. So anyway, <laughs> moving on. 
A lot of people will say, hey, Jason, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about pursuing category leadership because what if we fail? You know, this is like a huge long-term effort. Uh, and our response to that is, yeah, I get it. The odds are totally stacked against you. Let's not kid ourselves. But we would say that the pursuit of category leadership uh, is going to condition you. You're going to have a far better likelihood for quantum levels of growth versus the typical iterative growth that most companies are, are really looking for, right? If, if we're in a race just to be better and not different, then that means we're in a race for iterative growth. Um, and, and hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there are things that need to get done today uh, and that have KPIs that we're all familiar with, and we should go and do those things. We should be better. But if we're talking about quantum growth and really building coherence, um, this, is, this is the way to do it. Uh, and what you can see here is, you know, this is much bigger than category. Uh, this is the idea that there's organization, um, there's organizational coherence. There's coherence in terms of how your, product, your products and your services function and what that entire ecosystem looks like. Uh, of course, our focus is just getting in, pulling those things through into the brand marketing and sales side. Um, but this is certainly a big picture. So hopefully this is helpful. Um, just giving you some resources to wrap this up and then I'll take some questions. Uh, helping you along the way, uh, you can hire a growth studio to help support your efforts. And I'll, this, is, this is my minor uh, plug for ourselves. Uh, you know, we started as a digital marketing agency 15 years ago and we've migrated over the last 18 months, really evolved into this growth studio uh, category. And this is our own category. Uh, combining category design with jobs to be done and something we call Dunkirk Communications, uh, which really is about making sure that that coherence is built uh, through really smart communications. Um, there's other resources I can share with you, Play Bigger. A lot of what you heard today is um, concepts that are uh, from the Play Bigger group. And this book, Play Bigger, this is seminal to category design. I would highly recommend this uh, book was put out in 2016. There's some other here, um, positioning. This is like an age old classic, super relevant. Uh, I threw up selling the dream here too. Guy Kawasaki's got many books. I believe this is his best one. Uh, Transformative digital marketing. That's a Amazon bestseller we put out a couple of years ago. Uh, really good for, I would say, intermediate marketers or just marketers that would love a refresher course. Uh, the culting of brands. This is uh, Seth Godin calls this book uh, a hidden gem. So definitely uh, check that out. And then Competing Against Luck is uh, Clay Christensen's latest. Um, and so these are really good resources. Uh, finally, um, if you don't want to uh, read the book, Play Bigger, uh, you can see the center article there, Play Bigger, Understand Category Design. I just summarize it for you. Uh, if you want to know more about what's a growth studio, you can check that out too. And then again, uh, jobs to be done for marketing, not just product innovation. Uh, hopefully that is uh, super helpful for you guys. So thank you so much. Um, I hope that uh, I know it was kind of a lot of information and really quick. And I'm going to stop the share and see if I can uh, see if there's any questions. All right, I see. Yes, uh, I'd like to share this information with my colleague. Will you be sending out the recording afterward? Um, yes, I can do that. If nothing else, um, I'll just make sure that there is, a, uh, there is a link to the recording. Anything else? All right. Well, I think um, that's probably a wrap then. Gosh, I got through this a little faster than I thought, so hopefully I didn't talk too fast. Um, the nice thing about these, uh, these events is that they are actually recorded, and so um, you can see some things uh, that you may have missed the first time. Um, all right, we got a question. How can jobs to be done be used uh, to inform product innovation? Um, and I'll just say uh, on the product innovation side, uh, you know, the, the, the quick reference that I used on that um, is with the shoe company, uh, and that is Lem Shoes. So, so in that instance, you know, we went and did all these jobs to be done interviews. Uh, and one of the questions that we ask is, you know, what's happened since um, you've, you've purchased the product? And what we found is that there is overlap in people who are wanting to waterproof the product. So it's like, oh, well, that's pretty interesting. Um, and, and how does that inform product innovation, right? Um, I'll give you another quick example. We were working with a, a, a grass-fed dairy company. Um, this was super interesting. We, we talked to customers and we found um, that, you, you know, why do you buy grass-fed milk? And there's a lot of commonality in terms of answers you might expect. Well, you know, it's good, nutritious for my family, so on and so forth. But then we ran across this, this curious thing that 
people said, you know what, what's cool about it is I found that this, this type of milk froths in my coffee better than any other kind of milk. And so actually that's, that's the reason I, I buy it now. This thing is awesome in coffee. So it's like, oh, wow, that was unexpected. And what does that mean from a product innovation perspective? Um, does that company have a line of half and half? Uh, is there an opportunity to partner with a coffee company or even approach a different kind of audience uh, based on this, this focus and this use uh, with coffee? Um, and so, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it helps. Uh, Simon Hart asks, uh, thoughts on applying this to mature industries versus hot startup industries? So yeah, and this is a pretty big um, topic of conversation as well, because um, by and large, what you see, uh, and, and there's some interesting statistics on this too, is it is the hot startups uh, tend, to, tend to get into this and have a much easier time, right? I mean, if you think about, um, there's, there's specific terminology on this, but when you sit in a category leadership position for too long without innovating, well, then someone just comes along and kicks your ass, right? So think about um, Netflix and where